Thermodynamics is an essential tool for chemists. It tells us if a chemical reaction would happen and the price you would pay for it to happen. And by the end of this video, we're going to not only talk about the price you pay for reactions, but how you can actually profit from the monopoly game that is chemistry. So let's get started. So in this video, we'll be going over three things. Like any other game, we gotta lay out the players and rules first. Then we're going to demonstrate how our game works for chemical reactions. And last but not least, bridge our understanding of this game into measurements related to chemicals in real life. And by the end of this video, we'll also get to intuitively understand why chemists came up with and prefer to use the idea of enthalpy when they could have easily just used the idea of energy instead. So stick around to the end to find out. Please like and subscribe. On with the rules and players. Our first player is the system, our chemicals, mixtures, and so on, what we're interested in. And the surroundings are us, the player, and everything else that's not the system. And the goal of this game is to exchange around currency in such a way that the system does something for us, and that currency is energy. For example, we can take a loss and pay energy to change water into steam, or steam can cool down into water and we'd profit energy. And just as in the real world where you can use credit or cash to pay for the same thing, there are two ways, at least in thermodynamics monopoly, that we can transfer energy. You can transfer the energy in an orderly way, and that's called work, or you can transfer it in the form of random motion, heat. And you can simply track your net profit and loss by adding these two variables together. To be a little more technical, the quantity that describes the profit and loss has a name, the change in internal energy. And the reason I had to emphasize change is that internal energy alone actually describes how much money you have, aka your net worth. And of course, changing the amount of money you have means you've either profited or lost money. And this simple relationship of profits and losses is actually one of the only few rules of this game. You can't create money out of thin air, or energy in this case out of thin air, and every transaction has to obey this rule. It's also called the first law of thermodynamics. Now that we've learned the rules, let's start playing this game on chemical reactions. Okay, let's say we're trying to make a deal with the system, and tell it to make iodine monochloride as the first step of making iodobenzene, which can be used to activate benzene so that it can be attached to all sorts of molecules like adding a Lego onto a build. So it's a pretty useful molecule. The way you make it is by mixing iodine and chlorine gas together. And to make it, we gotta take a look at how much it costs. However, I'm going to be an actual prick of a game master and actually remove the answer from the manual. But there's no need for anyone to worry. There's actually a way to calculate this from scratch. There are four other bits of information in this book that's going to be useful to us. The cost of turning chlorine gas into chlorine atoms, the cost of doing the same to iodine atoms, the cost to sublimate iodine solid into gas, and the cost of breaking iodine monochloride into atoms. But in this case, it's not really a cost, it's more of a profit to the system. So first, let's level the playing field and convert the solid iodine into gas. And that's going to profit the system around 64 kilojoules per mole of iodine. Then we turn both gases into their atom forms. And there's a little complexity in the last step. We could just easily put 211 kilojoules per mole in the tally However, this energy value is only for making one of each chemical. So to make two, it makes sense to also double the amount of energy we put in as well. And since we're moving from the elements to iodine monochloride, we have to reverse the arrow. And that means flipping the sign of our cost as well. So in total, to make two moles of this chemical, the system would profit 34.3 kilojoules or 17.15 for just one mole. And the system's profit means our loss, so we end up losing 17.15 kilojoules per mole of the stuff made. This type of reaction here, one where we take the reactants in the standard state 
To make our desired chemical is called a formation reaction. And to explain briefly, standard state is kind of like the most stable or common form of the substance you find. The energy profit loss is called the energy of formation. And I'll show you a neat thing about seeing the world from a formation reaction standpoint. It allows you to be able to predict almost any energy change without even caring about what actually happened during the process. So let's take a look at cellular respiration as an example. Those of you who have taken biology before probably know that this is a very, very lengthy process that you probably had to memorize back in school. So imagine if we did a similar calculation to what we had done earlier for every step of the process. That would be one of the most cumbersome things ever. But to calculate the energy profit loss from this process, there's actually a hack that avoids this. And it hinges on the first law, the energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And what that actually also implies is that no matter the route you take, if you began as the glucose and oxygen and end up as carbon dioxide and water, you will always end up with the same energy profit loss. So a neat little exploit we can do is to pretend that we turn all of the reactants into their standard state forms and convert them all back into the products. The energy profit loss in this reaction is then just calculated the same way as before. And to be 100% clear, this is definitely not what happens in real life. And now we just tally up the energies of formation like before. Making six of anything requires six times the energy to make one. And there's no need to convert oxygen into its standard state because it already is in the standard state, so it costs nothing. And we swap the signs when we swap the arrows. And bada bing bada boom, we can now calculate the energy loss of the system, which means a profit to us, in particular, our cells. And to make things a little more compact, in practice, we would just add up the product's formation energies and subtract that from the reactants. The reason that the minus sign is there is because a formation reaction turns standard state into the chemical, but we have to reverse that. Of course, this works for all sorts of reactions with different coefficients, and this simple calculation is called Hess's Law. So now that we have a solid grasp on how to calculate profits and losses, there is a distinct difference between our game and actual Monopoly. It's just that we have to actually get our hands dirty and start measuring things. Because where else are we going to get these values from? But before we talk about that, I must confess, I have been lying to you a little. Because all this time, I've actually been explaining everything with the wrong currency. It's not that internal energy we are dealing with, we're actually dealing with something else called enthalpy. So the E's in Hess's law are actually H's, where H is for enthalpy. And even though the units are the same, there is a slight difference that matters a lot. So now you might ask, well, why did we just do that? Why do we need enthalpy? It seems unnecessarily complicated. And the answer is in the complications of measuring changes in internal energy. You might think it's as simple as taking a thermometer to measure the heat of the reaction, since temperature is a pretty logical way to measure heat. And the internal energy profit would just come from the heat alone. The problem here is that some reactions expand in volume or release gas. And that gas can also expand. This is a huge problem, since expansions means you're actually doing work. So you can try to attach a piston to measure the volume change, but this is really cumbersome and it can introduce things such as gas leaks. So there are two ways to deal with this. Make a container that doesn't allow any changes in volume, so no work could ever be done. Or two, create a weird new type of currency called enthalpy. Since there's no work, the energy would just come from the heat, or Q sub V for heat at constant volume. A neat trick chemists came up with is to surround this vessel with water, so that the water is now the surroundings to the system. And since anything the surroundings gain, the system loses, and vice versa, the heat exchanged is the same in size, with just different signs. 
and the temperature increase given the heat for water is related by something called the heat capacity. It's a measure of how much energy it takes to warm something up by 1 Kelvin. For example, given the same heat, water will only warm up about the fourth of how much steel warms up. And now, we can properly measure the internal energy change of the substance by relaying it to temperature. And this type of device is known as a bomb calorimeter. On the system's end, the internal energy change can also be given by the same heat capacity treatment. And for your calculus savvy people, this is how you formally define heat capacity at constant volume. But I digress. There is one big caveat to this though. It's just that most reactions aren't closed up in volume, they're open to air, at constant air pressure. And this is where enthalpy comes in. To really understand why enthalpy is defined this weird way, we mustn't take it at face value. Instead, let's look at what happens when we slightly increase it. This will of course increase the internal energy slightly. But for the pressure times volume term in the back, the nudge could come from both changes. So we include both in there. Next, we take the first law and rewrite it in terms of pressure and volume. Everything cancels out nicely, and we're left with the fact that there is no change in pressure. So the heat at constant pressure is the enthalpy. And this is why enthalpy was created, because it's so much more convenient to use enthalpy than internal energy in everyday situations where the pressure outside is constant, not the volume. Heck, the enthalpy measuring tool is even simpler than for internal energy. It's literally called a coffee cup calorimeter. And of course, we can also do the heat capacity treatment with enthalpy as well. There's the formal definition for those who are wondering. And that's the end of this video. We learned the rules of thermodynamics game. We know how to use Hess's law for enthalpy calculation, learned how to actually measure enthalpy, and found out why we even needed it in the first place. Don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the bell icon. The next topic is the one I'm looking forward to the most, entropy. And I'll see you next time. Bye.